Mediocre is the most generous term I can use to describe my first fall at Taft in 1979. I did okay in history and English, but I struggled in physics and Latin, and I was a stone cold disaster in math. So I did what I had always done until that point when faced with a subject in which I struggled. I gave up. Not completely, because that would draw the full wrath of the teacher, in this case one Mrs. Dara, who was tough. So instead, in class, I would concern myself more with social opportunities than with whatever the teacher was saying or writing. And at night, I would take a whack at a problem, scribble down a few numbers to demonstrate the attempt, confirm that it was too hard, and close my book. Mrs. Dara wasn't fooled, and she rewarded me with a C effort grade for the term. Back then, there were no D effort grades. C was as low as you could go. But I wasn't satisfied with just one C effort grade. My other C was in Latin, in which I had had an uneven term, but I guess my teacher, Mr. Cobb, interpreted my completely, yeah, <laughs> Mr. Cobb alone draws knowing laughs. Mr. Cobb, I guess he interpreted my completely blank fall exam booklet as evidence of poor preparation. So, so he too went with the C. And he was also right. I, I hadn't studied at all for the exam, thinking, I got this. Well, I didn't got this. And now Taft teachers have always had a lot of little things they say when they refer to students. One of them is, he knows why he's here, or she knows why she's here. I don't think teachers were saying that about me in the fall of 1979. But those two C effort grades were a gift. The gift of clear feedback that said, you're smart, you're underachieving, work harder. For whatever reason, I was ready to hear that message at that time, and I started to turn my academic career around. And I tell that true story for two reasons. First, to show that feedback from teachers that is not just about your achievement can make a real difference. And second, to emphasize how long ago that was. If you're a better math student than I was, you've already calculated that it was 35 years ago. And the Taft effort scale was already about a decade old at that point. <laughs> now, the, the, the D level was added at some point in the, uh, in the 80s or early 90s. But that aside, the scale was unchanged for close to half a century. There were attempts to revise or replace it over the years, but for various reasons it endured. And crucially, over time, over time, the AD scale became more like an AB scale. Unlike in my student days, Cs became rare, and Ds almost unheard of. Obviously, Ds didn't actually represent stunningly lame, but that is about how a student had to perform to receive one. Last year, over 90%, 95% of semester gr effort grades were A's or B's. Teachers and students knew that student effort could be broken down far more precisely than A or B. They also knew that one teacher's A was another teacher's B and vice versa. But it had become effectively an A-B scale. In short, Taft effort grades weren't offering the best feedback on the non-achievement areas of academics. So last year, Mr. Mack asked 15 faculty members to meet once a week to seek a solution. And here was his charge. Given our school mission, our insistence on academic excellence, recent research on character development in schools, and our belief that students grow by receiving feedback, what is the best method to articulate and assess the habits that lead to academic success and lifelong learning. So notice the clause uh, I've, I've made blue. Over the past decade or so, an academic cottage industry has emerged around, around this issue, or these, this question in particular. All other things being equal, what traits most contribute to a student's level of academic success? Now the all other, th all other things being equal part is enormously important. Lots of research confirms that kids raised in circumstances in which they are dealing with the stressors of poverty or domestic violence, or in which they are really read to, usually arrive in kindergarten or even preschool 
uh, already well behind their more fortunate peers. In short, accident of birth matters, and it matters a lot. But even students from similar backgrounds, and to the extent that this can be measured, intel similar intelligence levels achieve at wildly different rates in school. Why? So that committee of 15 read what experts had written on the subject, and to make a long story short, we identified the habits we felt most central to academic success and lifelong learning. Focusing on this, this is what we tried to always keep in mind, academic habits that, that students would understand and teachers could identify, teach, measure, comment on. In other words, we tried to build a replacement for the effort scale that was much more precise, but not baffling to students or difficult to apply for teachers. In the end, we decided on 10 habits in two categories. Since you may not have examined the attachment to my early August email, or looked closely at the habits rubric, which is actually inside the, uh, the back cover of the planner, here is a reminder of what those habits are and how we broke them down. Planning and persistence, which further breaks down into organization, class preparation, response to challenges, and engagement and self-regulation, breaking down to curiosity, collaboration, and focus. The left side, the planning and persistence side, is more outside class habits, while the right, engagement and self-regulation, is more inside class habits. Together, we think they offer a far more complete and detailed picture of how you're approaching your academic work day in and day out, night in and night out. In short, this is going to be the teacher's way to provide students with more useful feedback than we've been giving on habits that tend to determine achievement. Now, two weeks from today, quarter grades will be posted on Veracross just the student portal, not the parent portal, so your parents will not see them. That's when your teachers will submit their initial evaluation of your habits. You'll receive a number achievement grade, and then instead of an effort grade, two letter grades, one for planning and persistence, one for engagement and self-regulation. And here's what those, letter, those letters correspond to. This is regarding expectations, exceeds, meets, or approaches, needs attention, unacceptable. You can see that hand, hand uh, spells out the acronym MANU, sort of a handy acronym. Also, a shout out to class of 2014 graduate Emmanuel Medicine, who played a, a critical part. No, that's, that's not true at all. Um, so your report, guard, your report guard grades might look something like this. Just, just for instance, just for instance, OK? As you can see, you're not going to get a grade for each of the six habits that fall under the planning and persistence and self-regulation categories, because that would simply be too granular. However, teachers and students can and should initiate clarifying conversations, ones that will allow each of you to probe further into how student and teacher view your tendencies regarding each of those habits. In fact, in late October, just after mid-semester grades are posted, and those are grades that your, your parents will actually see, they're on the parent portal too, we are carving out time for you to delve deeper into your sense of your habits via a self-assessment and also for you to sit down with your teachers about this. And here's the timetable. So that's mid-semester grades, a little over a month from now. And then a week later, student academic habit self-assessment. And then a few days after that, again, we've carved out time for, for meetings to take place. And I will send out informa more information regarding these as they draw closer. But what I hope you'll take away now is that we are creating opportunities for you to familiarize yourself with this new academic habits rubric and how it will be applied. And during class, your teachers will be discussing this with you, or some may have already done this, by the way, um, how their particular expectations fall for each rubric level. For instance, what habits your Spanish teacher considers meets expectations level curiosity, or class preparation your math teacher views as unacceptable the way Mrs. Dara viewed my preparation so long ago. Now, no one is claiming that this rubric will be a magic bullet for each of you in all your classes. Most of you will continue to find some subjects challenging even if you reside continuously in the exceeds expectations suite. Nothing, for instance, could make me a first-rate math student. However, with that crystal clear feedback as motivation, I at least made it to the second semester of calculus by senior year. 
whereupon my brilliant math teacher, Mr. Philpott, having provided me an hour of one-on-one -on -one extra help every night all fall, gently suggested, I'm now sure out of self-preservation, that you know, maybe I should consider quietly abandoning my calculus career. <laughs> so I did, but with a sense of accomplishment for having made it that far. For those of you who struggle mightily in certain subjects, if the feedback you get from the use of this rubric offers you a stronger sense of how to work harder, how to develop key habits, the change will have been worth it. The faculty think it will be far more than that. It will do far more than that. We think it offers the whole community some common language beyond just effort to use in conversations and class comments to help all students in all subjects sustain or improve academically. And we appreciate your attention and support over the next few weeks and months as the rubric becomes part of Taft's academic culture. Thanks very much.